pathetic because they were pursuing them at the same time. It's just a coincidence that chronologically, the Madingos and the Crowns were being pursued at the same time. So the, the, the quest to come back to the country and the desire to come back to the country led into them forming a warring faction together. But later on, you find out that leadership was the problem. One group of people do not, I mean, a, a, a man from the Crown ethnic group said, my man, you, how are you sit down here and take order from a Madingo man? Well, we got to form our own group. And so the group divided. Now, we talk about country's involvement. Look at what happened. In Vahu, the president of Sierra Leone opened up a corridor to allow Ulimo to come in and attack the MPFL. But the, little did they know, little did they know that the revolutionary leader from Sierra Leone was all with his group was already in Liberia. They were trained, they trained at the Tajira base in Libya. And this group was already here. So as soon as they, as soon as they allow Ulimo to enter Vahu and come into Liberia, a corridor was created for Fode Sanko to move into Sierra Leone. You see, this is the type of repercussion. That's why neighbors of countries should not allow their territory to be used to launch attack on other countries. Because no telling. You think that Ekomog that came here, came here because they were sympathetic to Liberian cause? Or they wanted to see Liberia start fighting? No. Dado Jawara of, of Gambia realized that Samba Sanyang, Dr. Mani, the guy who overthrew him, was here with his Gambian special forces. So he sent troops to ECOWAS, to ECOMOB. You understand me? Guinea, like Sana Conte told that Babo Sumaniga was in Liberia, a revolutionary leader also from Guinea, one who was fighting the government, was in Liberia. So he sent Guinean troops to ECOMOB. The Serenians knew that Fode Sankov was here with his group in Liberia, so they sent Serenian ECOMOB. You see, uh, the Senegalese knew that um, they, uh, um, they, they were supporting Jawara too, and that's why they sent those Senegalese special forces that came from Des the Desert Storm. These are historical facts. The people who, you see, most people were not involved in this thing here. Even I look at all the members of the TRC there, none of them involved in the kind of thing here. They don't know what was happening, most of them. But it is good that the government call upon them. They are respectable citizens, qualified, and the government chose them to represent this group. And I want them to hold together as a group and try to get the facts out. Because they don't know anything I'm talking right now. They don't know that Echo Mark is a conglomeration of African leaders who were interested in protecting their own interests. That's why they sent Echo Mark leader here. Simply because their opponents were, in quote, in Liberia with Taylor. That's Echo Mark. What happened with Ekomog? The Nigerian generals and Ghanaian colonels and whatnot, what they were doing here? Selling arms, selling Liberian cars, looting our gold and diamond and other things, and selling them. What happened when the Americans and Abacha disagreed? And they, they won't talk, hey, someone, they, they, you know, the American let top secret business. The Ekomog generals and commanders in Liberia were selling arms. They had given, and they were selling to MPFL, they were selling to, 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 to all, all the fashions. We, we were buying from them too. Because <laughs> they were selling it. And they, they didn't realize that these arms were coming back to them, but they were making money. They had no interest. The, uh, the American or the international community was giving the Nigerians, uh, I mean the Ecomog, $30 million worth of arms and ammunition. The Nigerians and other generals who were there, no harms meant to any national, but what they were doing is that they were receiving the new arms and selling them under end user certificates to Arab groups that were fighting other wars. The arms that were destined for Liberia were being sold to other Arab warring groups around the world. And these arms were coming from Rio Tio Tinto in Spain, the Spanish um, uh, ammunition and manufacturing company. So they could trace the movement. Some of them ended up in Lebanon other ended up in Syria and whatnot. These were sold under different end user certificates. The, the commanders from Nigeria and other places had commands of their arsenal. So they would now they would now go to Makodi in Nigeria or somewhere in, in Kaduna or somewhere in Aburi in Ghana and get arms or weapons from their arsenal and bring it to Liberia. That's why you see most of the bombs that they dropped did not even explode, and some of them we took to Yamusukra and other places had made in India, 1966. 
made in Pakistan, 1967. These were arms that were manufactured for the Biafra Nigeria war in the 60s, who were in the arsenal that they brought in here to dump on the Liberian people after they sold the fresh arms that were given to them to other warring groups in the, in the Middle East who had the money to pay them. Now, when the Americans discovered that, they, they, had, they had a problem with Abacha. When they mentioned it to Abacha, they said that your generals are selling the arms. Abacha said, it's not possible. But then they gave him some evidence, and he got angry. That's when he changed, I think, on two or three occasions, he changed the field commander and called them back to base and, uh, and brought in other trusted ones. The trusted ones were the same way. They were dealers. They were dealers. They made a lot of money in Liberia here at the expense of the Liberian people. Of course, they kept some degree of peace. We say, well, thank God for Ecomark. But these are some of the scenarios, these are some of the things that happen in this country that young people might not know. And those of you who were maybe in the IGNO government uh, pushing Ecomark, Ecomark, did not know that these generals were dealing. They were selling the arm and that they were selling government uh, vehicles and, and shipping them out. As they say, one vessel left Moriva here and went to, to Nigeria. It was so loaded with, with cars and things and material things that the vessel sunk, sank in, in, the, in, the, in the harbor there in Apapa. These were all looted items from Liberia. I didn't say that. It was recorded by Reuters. But some of these things happen because of the involvement and the greed of some of these people. Um, they, um, you see, um, some of these um, countries also uh, were playing double games. Uh, we're angry with Abacha now, so we do not want Abacha to succeed in peacekeeping in Liberia. So what do we do? We support Ulima a little bit. We strengthen Mr. Taylor a little bit to make sure that Abacha does not succeed in keeping peace in Liberia. But at the same time, they've given Abacha millions of dollars on an ECOMOG to, to ensure that Taylor does not take Moravia by force of arm. So who is in between there? The Liberian people are suffering. Liberian people are dying. The war is prolonged. You go to a peace conference, uh, the big shots, the doctors and the lawyers and the big shots come over there, Liberian progressives will come in and when you look, the peace talk will break down because they don't have a stick in it, because they are not part of their accord. They want to be a part of it or part of something that they did not fight for or part of something that they are not a part of. And their burning desire to be a part of that prolong most of the peace conferences. Most of them doing the conference, they'll come and tell you, say, my man, we're on your side. We want to see Taylor. We've got to talk to him. These guys are doing the wrong thing in there. But the next minute, you will see them with Sawyer and them on the delegation moving there. He said, but what kind of people are these here? Do you know that there are people in Buchanan, Banga, Ganta, and other places that are dying, that are suffering, and they, that soldiers are overrunning them and hurting them, and we want to see relief for them. That's why we are here. You came here for a job. If you don't get a job, I mean, the peace talk will break down. But we had experts on that too. Because whenever we wanted a peace talk to break down, we knew who to send. We knew who to, who to send to the, peace, to the peace conference that we didn't want. Now look at the, I've given you an idea of some of the regional revolutionary leaders such as Fode Sanko and General Mosquito and General Issa. Now another thing most people don't know, General Issa, who was the second in command in the RUF, was not even, he's not even a Soviet Union. He's not even a citizen of Selenium. He is from Gambia. He's a Gambian special fool that was a bodyguard to Fodis and Call. And he met him only here. He met him in, maybe in Libya, or but he met him only here. Can you imagine that a foreigner in a country is the leader of a RUF with over 150,000 people fighting? A foreigner. It's because of the lack of coordination. Because of the lack of understanding. You don't know who is who. Even in the, in the play, I hear somebody say the other day that the MPFA had, I think that the, uh, Stewart or somebody asked the question, MPFA had 70-something thousand fighters. Never. MPFA, MPFA never had 25,000 fighters. The roster never went up to 25,000. But there were a lot of people who had arms who were not fighters. But they made sure that they had arms. If you consider them as part of the group, then they were. Then they were over, over, over 200,000. But actual roster of command structure, military uh, uh, areas, I, never think it, I, I don't think it exceeded that. Because when I went out, 
to transform this war machine into a mass based political party, I had a roster with me. And every constituency or every division headquarters that I went to, I estimated the number of men from muster. And I have a rough idea from my general concept of the number of people. And I don't think it ever exceeded 25,000. The RUF had over 150 to 200,000 fighters because of the population in Sierra Leone. All the people, Fodor Sango had a very popular revolution and most of the people from his region and other areas um, joined his revolution and uh, fought along with him. So the issue of the many transitional governments and the 20 political parties, or you know in Liberia, I think we've got 16 or 17 tribes, you can see that we've got about 16 or 17 political parties. It means that every party that one tribe. That's how Liberia is. Liberia is so divided on the line of tribe and interest that every group, every political, every tribe got a political, every tribe got a political party, and that no other group will support another group. What did they? They thought that in 1980 they were going to eliminate the American Liberians. All the war and war and war and war we fought, we came back. Election time, they elected an American Liberian Taylor. Lord King, they say American Liberian, do they do that, do that, we have everything, what happened? Election King, they elected who? Another American Liberian, Ellen Sharif. So when are we going to have a homogeneous group of indigenous Liberians who claim to be indigenous Liberians who will stand together for one for once as one group of people for to determine the destiny or the future of their own people? When are you going to have that? Never can you unite from Zamba time. Well, a friend of mine says Zamba had to die before a certain tribe wore trousers. That had better the war where the war was in Liberia. But uh, we say these things so that people can understand that the, the nature, the attitude of Liberians, our response, our overzealous attitude and response to our own brothers and sisters have caused a lot of mayhem dissatisfaction, discontentment between and amongst our people because we are responsible for our own decadence. Nobody should tell you that one group of people are responsible or everybody come, they take all the problems, they put it on Taylor Hay. Taylor is the one who caused all the trouble. Yeah, Taylor brought the MPFL with the, warring, with, 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 with the war. But for God's sake, there were 12 other, or 10 other warring factions that came in as a result, prolonged the war. There were foreigners who were operating companies and businesses here, doing their own business, logging companies and concessions, operating fully, paying taxes to him, uh, making contributions and all to the various war fashion that they operated under. These are people who fuel the crisis too. There were generals and colonels in the country making money as a consequence of the war. There were Liberians going from village to village, from town to town, killing and murdering their own people. There were people who went and killed their brothers and sisters because they had land dispute. Another important thing that causing trouble in Liberia. And we don't realize that. The, the, the sons, and, and this is causing another big economic problem too, and I think our history should record that. The sons and the daughters of wealthy paramount and clan chiefs have abandoned their land in the rural areas and have come to Morovia fighting over land in Dele Peninsula. Most of the tribal chiefs and elders in the country were very wealthy people. Most of them in villages and towns, the, 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 the citizens of those towns and villages worked very hard to send their children to school. The children of the chiefs and elders sent them to school in Monrovia or school in other counties. As soon as they come back, graduate from school and come back, some of them come to Monrovia rent a room and begin to stay in one room here and start to act like they are poor people. They are the sons and the daughters of the wealthy landowners. They do not get their education and go back to those villages and towns where their parents own thousands of acres of land and help to develop and improve that land, help to transform the natural resources of, the, of, of that land into semi-finished or finished product. Instead of doing that, they come and sit in Monrovia, vacillating, looking for government jobs and uh, uh, whatnot, and leave the, the, the heritage of their parents and their villages uh, uh, and discourage the citizens in that area. Most of them, when they come back, instead of 
instead of even marrying their own tribes, they want to marry an American Liberian woman in Monrovia and go and bring his brother and sister them from Nimba or Bon County to be their slaves, to be their servants. This attitude is very bad, it's appalling. That when you are, I mean, the citizens of a, a constituency fight hard, your father is chief, they help to educate you and, and whatnot abroad, you come back, instead of going to that land and developing the land and improving the land, you come to Monrovia and put on your ratio and start going to court for one lot, and you and somebody fighting for years for one lot, and people come and stay and act like they are poor and they are the unfortunate people in the country when they are actually the wealthy landowners that have abandoned their constituencies and come to Monrovia in search of what they did not leave here. That has created economic hardship in the country. No longer is food coming from the rural areas. Some of the chiefs were independent people and you all know, Brazo Twe, Tamba Taylor, Kekura Poto, these are owners of big land. And you see most of their children and family around Monrovia fighting over little land and whatnot when they have hundreds of thousands of acres there of land. I know some of those men are turning in their graves because they see their children uh, uh, draining their, their constituency into the bottomless pit of degradation from their own hopelessness and carelessness. Uh, the issue, another issue that I want to look at is the issue of... Um, Liberians believing that anything that is foreign is better. That's why you see in our country, people say they are committed to national development effort and they are committed to change and all that. What has changed? How can a country in 2008 allow foreigners to come into our country as store boys, people who stand behind the counter to give you one tin or tin when you buy it? That why we got in the country, we are so educated and so alert that we have this quality of people here in our country. We give them work permit, we give them resident permit to come in our country and be store boy. A store boy in a country where 90%, 95% of our people are unemployed. We still allow that, that thing. We should stop this mentality that whatever comes from abroad is better. Or any individual that comes from anywhere man you see, he's supposed to know both or he's supposed to be clever. I always tell people, when I went to graduate school, I went to school with white people. I went to Switzerland to school. I was not the last in the class. So I don't have no extraordinary regard or extraordinary, I prostrate myself to any white man because his skin white. And that's the problem we got in Liberia. Anybody who see one little white girl or one little white boy vacillating around the country, they begin to follow them and start pointing their finger to their brothers and sisters as though they are inferior. It's not true. I went to school with white people, I was not the last in the class. So I don't feel that every white man is superior to me. And Liberia should stop thinking with that kind of mentality because it is destructive. It is destroying us and affecting us in this country. Now any little uh, lame dog that come here uh, operating with one little, ML, one little uh, uh, NGO jeep driving around in the village uh, destroying our youth there, our young girls, uh, uh, following men and women and all that kind of thing there, we call them people that are human beings. They come to Liberia and they are better. They are the people causing the trouble in this country. They were the people who fueled the crisis. They are the ones who had Liberians fighting against Liberians so that they can benefit. Most of the misinformation that go out in this country here have been given between Liberians and some of the Liberians here who you say important people work for some of these organizations and they are the ones who are filtering out of this country here all kind of false information and false representation that led this country into pandemonium. They have to keep their jobs. They have to make Liberia look like a hardship place. It's rough here. They're killing people. You go outside Maria, 30 miles, they will cut your throat. I have to go there, so I need extra money. You have to increase the budget every year. They're bringing these monies in, squandering them, and spending them at the expense of the Liberian people. Liberians are not employed. Let us stop this mentality, this overzealous nature of supporting foreign, foreigners and other people in our country. I don't say dislike them. I have nothing against foreigners. Uh, but sometimes when I tell people, say, oh, the man don't like Americans. No, that's not true. I have six children that are American citizens. I have a daughter in the U.S. Army. I have sons and there are engineers that work for the for, for, for United States government and other places. All my children were educated in the United States. They are American citizens. I didn't say they have green card. I said they were born in America. Because during the early days when I was having my children, they could not have cesarean operation here in the early, in the late 70s and 80s. So my wife had to travel to abroad, abroad to have children. So my children were born in America. I respect America. I love America. I have property there. I own property there. 
But by no means do I think that anybody there is super, more superior to me. And let's destroy that mentality that we have in this country that is keeping us down and causing a lot of uh, chaos and trouble in our country. Now the transitional governments. Another group of people that came in, I told you that I work in every transitional government. And I know that the objective, the cardinal objective of some of these transitional governments were very straightforward and clear. There were a group of people who came to try to pillage the coffers of the economy of this country. That's all it was. A group of hustlers and uh, called themselves progressive who came in and tore up the economy of this country that today we are still suffering from it. But everybody say, I was not the one that spoiled it, so I'm not the one that's going to fix it. Uh, the other issues that we will raise will continue, but I, I myself want to to take a little break now and go to the bathroom and maybe smoke a cigarette, and then we can continue later.